Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for uh, for joining us at this weekly Greater Manchester briefing on our response to COVID-19. Joined today by the Deputy Mayor, Sir Richard Lees, leader of Manchester City Council. I'm going to hand over to Richard in a moment to take you through the latest uh, figures and to update on the uh, health service uh, position. Uh, but let me start with one figure this afternoon, and that is sadly the latest um, a death count uh, in Greater Manchester, which on the latest uh, figure we've been given is 2,933. Obviously, we've all become very used to hearing these figures on regional and national news. And sometimes it's uh, easy to forget that each and every one of those 2,933 people are someone's mum, dad, brother, sister, uh, somebody for whom perhaps because of the circumstances we've been living through, families and friends have not been able to to grieve for in the in the normal in the normal way. Um, it's a really, really tough time and, and remains so for for everybody. And recognising all of this, um, my team have been working with uh, Manchester Cathedral on a service of remembrance for all uh, victims of COVID-19 um, that will take place tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. And at the same time, uh, we will uh, launch an online book of remembrance. We're very grateful to Dean Rogers Govender for leading tomorrow's uh, service and obviously we would want to encourage as many people as possible uh, to take part online but also uh, to to be able to make use of the book of remembrance which is an extremely uh, poignant uh, tribute to those we've lost. The reason I wanted to start today colleagues with bringing this to your attention is really to ask a favour of you all if you were able to um, publicise the link uh, to the cathedral's uh, Facebook uh, account um, on your bulletins uh, this evening or in uh, your, um, uh, your 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 uh, web content this evening, we'd be really, really grateful because we think that will obviously bring it to the attention of a large number of people who might otherwise not, not be aware that it's uh, happening. And also the link to the Book of Remembrance, which is very, very, easy to use uh, both for people to see uh, those we've lost but also to, to add tributes to their to their own loved ones so just be really grateful if uh, if you were able to give any publicity to those links we're issuing a press release uh, as of about now uh, which gives you more more details on both the service and the uh, the online uh, book of remembrance um, and we'd just be really grateful if you could give that any pre-publicity. So uh, no more from me to begin with. I'll now hand over to uh, Deputy Mayor Sir Richard Lees. Richard. Uh, thanks, Andy, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to run through a few uh, figures around where we, we're currently up to. Uh, with COVID-19. Uh, I'm going to qualify that as always with, uh, well, hopefully it won't be for always, but it's certainly still the case that uh, we still don't have all the data that uh, we think we need in order to uh, be at our best in managing any future outbreaks, although data continues to improve. And what we will do is give you uh, the most up-to-date data that we have of, of available. So, and we'll continue uh, to do that. Um, the story continues to be largely a positive story. The uh, uh, seven day uh, rolling average for hospital admissions is now at a, a low of 2.7 over the last uh, seven days. Uh, the positive test continues to, the, the increase continues to reduce, if I can put it th that way. The number of care homes uh, with currently with cases has gone down from 9% to 8%. Uh, ICU beds occupied by COVID-19 patients is now down from 22 to 15 and non-ICU COVID patients from 187 to 138. And uh, that's also on the background that overall bed occupancy in our hospitals has gone up over the last seven days from 73.4 to 75.1 which uh, if you like, the, the good news is that there are more, uh, I'm going to describe them as business as usual patients uh, being able to uh, get into hospital and get the treatment that uh, they, they need. So that is uh, generally a positive story. Uh, 
The key stat that we are uh, using now is the uh, number of positive tests per 100,000 population. And uh, just to give a little bit of context to this as well, compared to the previous week, uh, we've had an increase in the number of tests. So number of tests per 100,000 went up from 597 to 656. And that, fi uh, that figure will fluctuate, but uh, with an increased number of tests, the rate of positive tests has actually gone down again for Greater Manchester from 10.2 to 8.7. I'm not sure if the slides, you can see the slide, but there is a slide with all, if you can see the slide that's got all those figures uh, on. There is only one uh, place that's shown an increase over the past seven days, which is uh, Salford, but uh, Salford is well within margins of safety. So there, there isn't any particular concern about Salford with that uh, increase. And again, these figures will fluctuate uh, from week to week. And to a certain extent, the lower they get, the more they are likely they are to fluctuate up as much as uh, as much as down. So from that point of view, uh, generally a very positive story. If we look, to, uh, look at the Opal surveys we do across the sectors, uh, most of those are really positive as well. Uh, still ongoing concerns about PPE. We have adequate supplies at the moment in every category, but still they are not uh, supplies that where we effectively have a large future store of that. So uh, with, with that exception, I think everything else is in a fairly good state. Uh, and I'm going to put all the uh, uh, caveats uh, within this. And first of all is that uh, we are planning for winter. It uh, might seem a long way off, but uh, uh, hopefully we're going to start talking about uh, uh, flu jabs in the next couple of weeks because we'd like to get, get that done as early as, uh, early as possible. Uh, there is the risk not only of COVID coming back, but of other epidemics, particularly flu epidemic uh, at the same time. And all of this says that we have to uh, continue to be uh, very careful and make sure that we uh, stay safe ourselves and keep other people uh, safe. Um, in those terms, uh, we've now seen a loosening of lockdown, particularly around uh, hospitality businesses. It's probably going to be another seven days before we start to see whether there is any impact of that. But uh, I can certainly say from uh, a Manchester City Centre point of view and other places where there is a, generally a higher footfall, the premises are mainly, well, no, almost entirely behaving very responsibly. To, uh, responsibly. They're following the guidance that they've been given and there have been very little cause for either uh, council officials across Greater Manchester or uh, Greater Manchester Police to intervene in, what's, uh, in what's, what's going on. It's generally a positive story there. Uh, we are making sure that uh, we learn from what's going on in other places. Clearly, Leicester has been very high profile over the last uh, couple of weeks, and we've looked very carefully at what happened in Leicester, what they've been doing to deal with the situation they find, and we're making sure that we do learn lessons here. And similarly, we're looking around the country about what's happening in other places and making sure that uh, that our practice is informed by the best of what's going on and indeed informed by the worst of what's going on as well because you can learn from other people's mistakes as well. So uh, a positive story around COVID-19 compared to previous uh, weeks. Uh, again, repeat, we're not out of the woods yet and we do need to continue to be careful and to stay safe. I'll finish there, Andy. Thanks very much uh, indeed, Richard. Just two uh, further updates from me before we open up to your questions. The first on illegal raves. Obviously, it's been a big theme of these briefings uh, in weeks gone by, and I thought it was important just to uh, bring you up to date on the latest action by Greater Manchester Police and to show how we have uh, very much improved our intelligence gathering and our response uh, to uh, these events, which continue to be a uh, a real concern, the latest figures being that Greater Manchester Police disrupted uh, a number of events, particularly one on Friday evening in Bolton, Smithles Park, 150 people. Uh, the event was disrupted and dispersed. A sound system was 
uh, seized uh, on Sunday evening in Oldham on an industrial site, 250 people disrupted uh, and a dispersal order used, three arrests um, and some, um, so, some minor injuries sustained by officers are completely unacceptable. Uh, and then Sunday evening, a larger gathering uh, in Manchester of 300 people, uh, again, uh, dispersed though, but without any um, a negotiated dispersal of, of the event. So I just wanted to bring to your attention that we continued to work very hard uh, with GMP, uh, improving the intelligence gathering. What, what we would ask people again is if anyone hears about one of these uh, events, if they are, would, uh, let us know via 101. Um, it, it is uh, something that uh, we would discourage anyone from even considering to attend one of these events is to put yourself at considerable risk. There is no uh, security, there's no uh, proper organisation. Of course, there's the risk of spreading the virus. Um, we, we ask you uh, to bear all of those things uh, in mind. Uh, we say to parents, please do not uh, turn a blind eye or worse, drop your son or daughter off uh, at one of these events for all the reasons I've just given about the dangers that they uh, that they pose. Um, we're going to continue to work very closely with our 10 uh, districts. So the message goes out to anyone who is uh, organising these things that we are uh, working hard. We will disrupt uh, these events and I'm grateful actually to colleagues in Greater Manchester Police who've uh, really um, worked hard in the last few weekends uh, to disrupt these events uh, where they possibly can. And as you've seen today, they are uh, having some success in, in uh, achieving that. Just to move on to uh, a second issue, uh, which is um, a week of action on uh, compliance with regard to face coverings on public transport. This week of action is being launched tomorrow uh, by Transport for Greater Manchester but very much working with our partners in uh, Greater Manchester Police, British uh, Transport Police and, and staff employed by the transport uh, operators. Um, I, I think you should be able to see a graph, um, another table appearing on your screen. Um, this just gives you a, a feel for how this uh, has been developing. This is Metrolink. Uh, the yellow bar is the morning uh, peak travel time the grey, the evening, and that gives you um, a picture of the, the latest levels of compliance. You, you see the, the lockdown period, uh, very low levels of compliance, but then the change to uh, mandatory wearing on the 15th of June, and you've seen significant increase. We think this week the figures have gone higher still with the, the public prominence of the debate about face coverings. But um, Sir Richard and I think it's very, very important that we project uh, a safety first approach on public transport to give people confidence to return to the city centre if they are returning to work, uh, to get that message out that it's a, a safe um, environment on public transport and uh, in in the city centre more generally. Uh, that, that building of that safety message is important to building the business confidence uh, that will come with that. But we recognise that we've could do more given the figures that I'm showing you there around levels of compliance and we want to go uh, a stage uh, a stage further uh, encouraging people uh, to uh, do what is right uh, by their their fellow uh, passengers but of course the more that everybody wears them we all protect uh, each uh, each other um, so there will be a visible uh, presence particularly on uh, a number of days over the coming weeks it won't just be on Metrolink it will be focusing on bus as well. Um, we do have the ability to find people if they are not wearing or refuse to uh, wear a face covering um, and it's not our intention to use those powers. We'd rather do it by persuasion and encouragement, uh, but nevertheless those, those powers exist. Um, of course, people will first be asked to leave public transport, but um, as I say, there is the option of, of, of the fine. If um, people are uh, struggling to uh, have a face covering or forget to bring one, they can be obtained from travel shops and ticket offices or, or sometimes TFGM members of, of staff. We uh, would want to draw to people's attention that there are people who have um, a justifiable reason um, 
for reasons of um, medical reasons or perhaps uh, because of a disability as to why they would not be required to wear a face covering. And we've um, issued a TFGM travel journey assist card, which would uh, be able to be to be shown in those instances. So we'd encourage people who are worried about being challenges to obtain one of those cards, but we'd also ask other passengers to bear that in mind uh, when when traveling, that some people may have a justifiable reason why uh, they are not wearing a face uh, face covering. Um, so we will be launching this week of action uh, tomorrow. We would want to, through you, through the media, let people know that this is this is happening. This is a gear change as to where we've been. We've started off with a, a low level approach to encouraging people to 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 wear in coverings. We're going to go up uh, a level as of tomorrow. Uh, we still don't want to find anybody. That's not our intention. Uh, but of course, that power uh, lies there in the background because at the end of the day, if people aren't uh, following uh, the, um, the 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 rules, it may obviously limit other people's ability to feel confident enough in in using public transport. And at the end of the day, we now need to uh, change the culture about this and um, create that safety first culture that I was speaking of. We have Bob Morris from Transport for Greater Manchester with us this afternoon. Bob couldn't answer any specific questions that uh, I may not have covered in that introduction if colleagues want to uh, to think about that as we as we go into questions. Ross, I think I'll probably leave it there and and open up uh, to um, to the questions and hand over to you. Thanks very much. I'm going to go and take a question from Andy Smith at Wish FM about the memorial service. He's asking, can you tell us a bit more about the online memorial service tomorrow and why you think it's an important thing to do? Alison Spooner from Global Radio also asks, why is now the right time uh, to hold a memorial service like this? Well, th thank you. Um, thank you both. Um, Andy, let me start with your question. I think it's, it's an important thing to do when you listen to people who've lost lost loved ones throughout this period, you know there's been some heartbreaking stories of people not able to grieve uh, in the normal way. Um, so you know they've they've suffered a sudden bereavement, but they've had none of the ability to come together as a family to remember. Uh, and you know this has been something that's been very very much in our minds, particularly also those who've been working in health, social care, on public transport serving others you know there is a kind of feeling that we need to um uh, mark what they what they have done the, the sacrifice that they've that they've made and on the online book of remembrance it, it will differentiate health and social care staff so that uh, uh, people can um, can see uh, those who've been working to, to help others during this time and and sadly are no longer no longer with us so it, it was felt uh, an important thing uh, to do uh, obviously, the um, to answer uh, the second question, Ross, uh, why, why now? Um, obviously, there's always going to be a difficult time to, to decide when to do this. I was very conscious that um, for those who were bereaved, this was becoming an increasingly difficult uh, time. And people, uh, I think the cathedral felt too, that people needed uh, a focal point, And we hope that the service will provide that. And of course, the online book of remembrance is, is there permanently now. Uh, to be updated um, as and when uh, people want or feel able to do that. So, you know, this is a, a, a service that's going to be up and running. We hope it will bring some uh, comfort uh, to people. Uh, and I would be really grateful if you could all publicise uh, the, um, the, the links overnight uh, so that we, we make this service available to as many people as possible across Greater Manchester. Thanks, Andy. And just to say as well, those links uh, to the service and the Book of Remembrance can be found in the Q&A uh, bar at the side. Um, Nigel One Barr. To add, Ross, if I may, just, just very briefly, is obviously it's not a normal ser service in terms of a full attendance. There will be social distancing observed within the cathedral, but we will be joined by uh, people working in the NHS, social care, other public services, some bereaved families. Uh, and of course, uh, mayors and some leaders from from our district. So it's not a full civic service, but as much as we can manage in, in the circumstances, led, as I said, by Dean uh, Dean Rogers, uh, Govender, Bishop David Walker will be in attendance too. So um, uh, yeah, we, we felt it was the right right moment to, uh, to to bring people together as people begin to emerge from lockdown. We felt it was right to um, to, to mark 
uh, what, what we've all lived through in, in the last few, few months and those in particular we've lost. Thanks very much. I'm going to move on to a question from Nigel Barlow about Manchester uh, for you, Andy, and then we'll bring it to Richard. Uh, the Prime, is the Prime Minister correct when he calls for a general return to offices? And if so, do you agree that it's needed to give a boost to our town centres and city centres economy? Um, and connected to that, should the message um, around only using public transport for essential, essential journeys now be changed? Thanks, Nigel. I think the Prime Minister is right to say that uh, we need to start to think about planning for a return to the office. And he said that, uh, I think, in answer to a question last week, we've not yet seen the um, you know, official change in the guidance to work from home if you can, but I anticipate that's probably coming soon. And yes, I think we do need to, um, to think about a safe return. So, Nigel, what I've just been saying about Metrolink is very much a precursor to that. You know, building that kind of safety culture, high levels of compliance with face coverings is a really important first step to build that confidence to people to feel able uh, to return. So the week of action is really important in this uh, context. Uh, but I'll you know, hand over to Sir Richard in a second. Both of us would have a, you know, a concern about the city centre, bringing people back to the city centre, the vibrancy of the city centre. This is important uh, and also supporting businesses uh, businesses there. So, you know, we do have to, to do this carefully in a phased way, but the time is coming where we do have to begin to encourage people to, to begin to make that uh, return. And certainly from my own point of view, uh, you know, I would certainly be looking uh, in, let's say, September to beginning to see maybe around a quarter of, of the staff uh, beginning to return to Churchgate House. Um, doing it in a staggered way so that we're not putting all of that pressure on public transport at, at the same time uh, and we'll be issuing a bit more guidance uh, about that but no, I think it is right to start to plan to do this but to do it in as safe a way as possible and by preparing for it and talking about it in this way I think we can uh, begin to build that confidence uh, for people uh, as they begin to, to think about their plans. I don't want necessarily to hear organisations say oh we're not planning on re to return to the office at all. I, I, I don't think that's right either. I think we need to um, you know, begin planning for a safe return. Thanks, Andy. I'll pass over to Richard as well on that one. Oh, on mute, Richard. It's not, it's not actually an easy, uh, easy question. And it's something I don't say very often, but it's something I do have some uh, sympathy with the Prime Minister uh, around and uh, yes we do need people to return to work and uh, certainly as far for the economy we need the economy to be functioning the benefit they'll give to uh, other businesses I know from a survey we've done from uh, uh, council staff that although uh, staff who are working from home feel safe working from home for a lot of them, it's had a negative impact on their well-being as well. So there are personal reasons why people need to return to uh, what's seen as, uh, generally speaking, as normality. So for all of those reasons, yes, we do need to get people back into offices and their normal place of work. But I think, as Andy said, it, it, we need to do it safely. And um, there are a whole range of things around the planning of a safe return to work. There need to be risk assessments for individual staff. A lot of officers have to reconfigure to be able to get people in, to get people in safely. Cleansing regimes have to be uh, changed as a response to COVID-19. All of those things need to be done to make sure we do get a safe uh, return. And as already talked about public transport, yes, we'd like to have more people using public transport. It's got to be done uh, safely. But also for uh, local authorities that, that in order to help keep people safe uh, we do need to be able to be adequately financed to do that as well I can say I talked earlier about uh, the city centre and what uh, uh, GMP and council officers were doing I think the last SIP rep I got from council staff was something like 2 a.m on Sunday morning about Saturday Saturday night we're continuing to have to spend to keep people safe and we need proper support to do that. So, uh, yes, I, I think the Prime Minister is largely right, but in being right, that, that there are then consequences of things that government has to do and government uh, things that government has to help us do locally. 
Thanks, Richard. I'm um, going to go to a question uh, from Joseph at the Bolton News and Berry Times. Um, he's asks, ask Andy on this first. Are GM boroughs which border Blackburn uh, with Darwin, such as Bolton and Berry, at any greater risk of a spike in cases and consequently a local lockdown? Thanks, uh, uh, Joseph. And uh, again, probably Richard might want to, to, to comment on this one as well. Um, the honest answer is is yes. Uh, there is a greater risk of uh, the infection spreading uh, and therefore a, a spike in cases. I wouldn't go so far as local lockdown, Joseph, because obviously we're not seeing that in, um, in in Blackburn. There are measures being taken there. Um, and obviously we, we want to support our colleagues there. So I, I can say I think there's a meeting uh, later today between um, our, the lead Director of Public Health in Greater Manchester together with uh, her colleague, uh, Director of Public Health in, in Bolton. Of course, we, we want to um, support colleagues in uh, Blackburn with Darwin as much as we as we possibly can and um, manage the situation together. So of course there's a, there's a greater risk, hence the hence the meeting. But um, I think uh, talk of local lockdown is is premature, both in Blackburn and of course uh, in Bolton, given the figures that Sir Richard uh, put put forward earlier. Thanks, and I'll, I'll bring Richard in on that one. Uh, well, I, I agree with what uh, Andy said. I, I think a couple of things to add. There is really close cooperation between the directors of population health in Blackburn and Darwin with, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, all of the surrounding local authorities, but in our case, particularly with Bolton and, and Bury. So there, there is work going on to make sure that any risk is effectively managed. And I talked earlier about uh, learning from places like uh, Leicester. One of the things that clearly has happened in Leicester is that we've seen uh, a, a, a greater number of people catching the virus in family. So we, we've seen that within particular households. We know that there are uh, families that stretch across uh, the borders between particularly Bolton and Blackburn, but to a certain extent very and Blackburn, but we're able to use that knowledge and we're able to use some of the techniques that we used in Leicester to be able to work with communities to make sure that we can reduce risk. But so it comes down, yes, as Andy said, there is greater uh, risk, but we are aware of that risk before it becomes a crisis. And that there are things we know that we can now do in order to make sure that we mitigate that risk. Thanks, Richard. Uh, going back to Andy, just a follow up question uh, from Joseph about tomorrow's uh, service. Uh, he's asking, what message do you have for the families of the three employees at the Bolton NHS Foundation Trust, the Royal Bolton Hospital Cleaner and a senior nurse at the Bolton Hospice who died uh, due to COVID? Well, thanks, Joseph. I, I guess it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that, that we've been thinking of them uh, all the way through this. One of our uh, uh, leaders, uh, Tom Tasker, leads on primary care across Greater Manchester, said at an early meeting uh, of our committee that we needed to mark proper, properly the contribution uh, of NHS and social care staff uh, through this, particularly those we've lost. And uh, we we have not forgotten that. And all uh, the way through this, we wanted to come to a moment where we did properly create a moment where we can um, uh, pay our tributes uh, to those who were serving their community, uh, putting themselves at risk in doing so, uh, and uh, who now are no longer with us. And you know, we can't pay them a, a kind of higher compliment in saying that you know they are the best of us. We we won't forget what they they have done. Uh, and tomorrow is just a moment when we can step back and and say that and say to their families, you know, you should be so tremendously proud. Uh, to to have uh, someone in your family who did that at this hour of need, uh, as somebody who uh, put themselves forward in the service of others, and we just want to say, as representatives of the city region, uh, that that uh, we will always remember them and we will always be be grateful uh, to them for doing what they they did. And you know, going back to the earlier question, Ross, about why is now the right time? You know, I think it's been really difficult, hasn't it, for those families. Uh, Joseph, who've lost loved ones, you know, through this strange period of lockdown. And it would just feel really odd if the world was to start returning to normal and nothing was done to, to recognise that or to 
uh, to 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 honour those who, who um, have have been uh, been lost. So that's the reason why. And also, we just think it would be wrong to to let those families almost sort of look as though the world has moved on and no one's noticed. So that's why we're doing the service tomorrow. We're so grateful to the cathedral uh, for for hosting it and leading leading it, and we hope it will bring uh, some comfort to families in Bolton and beyond. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I'm going to take a question uh, from uh, Tom Dambach at Hits Radio. Uh, he's asked you, Andy, the Prime Minister has committed to an independent inquiry into how the government handled the crisis. What issues in particular would you like for that uh, inquiry to look at? Um, yes, it is important that there, there should be an independent inquiry, uh, Tom, and I'm glad it's been committed to, I would say, as soon as possible, because, you know, I said this yesterday, we are looking uh, at a winter without a vaccine. There are things that could be done right now that might put us in a, a stronger position to face that uh, coming winter. So, you know, obviously you can't look into everything, but there are some specific issues here. I think issues around social care and the support for social care staff uh, in terms of pay particularly with regard to staff who might need to self-isolate. I think there are things that could be done uh, to shore up the position of social care, uh, build its resilience uh, before we go into the winter. Uh, as you've heard me say before, I think there are still unresolved issues around data and the provision of data uh, to, uh, to councils. As Sir Richard was saying before, it's got better, but it's still not good enough. Uh, in my view, those those councils who know their communities better than anyone else need to be given everything that the government knows to be able to um, to, to bear down uh, on this on, on this virus. Um, I think there are broader issues in terms of the ability of people in the lowest paid employment uh, to follow official government advice. It's very difficult for somebody on a zero hours contract who knows they won't be paid if they have to self isolate to follow what they're being asked to do by the government. I think those issues need to be to be looked at. There are so many issues actually that I could sort of lay out uh, today, but I'm trying to keep it on the practical issues that I think if they were addressed now, they could make a difference <coughs> given what's coming in the winter. And I would say to the Prime Minister, you know, some of this could be done right now to learn as many lessons as we can to to put ourselves in the strongest possible position for what might be coming uh, later later in the year. I don't think it's right to say it all comes for another day in the in the distant future. Uh, some of this should be done uh, now. The academic Ac Academy of Medical Sciences uh, published a really clear report yesterday about preparing for a second wave. I gather at Prime Minister's questions today, it wasn't clear whether the Prime Minister had read it. Well, I think he should read it. And I think there are kind of steps that could be taken right now to improve our national resilience going into the winter. And I would obviously encourage him to do that. Thanks, Andy. Um, Tom, as a follow up as well, um, it seems a portion of passengers still aren't wearing masks ahead of the week of action. What action has already been taken? And this may be one for Bob. Uh, are there any figures on any fines that have been issued to passengers who haven't been compliant so far? Well, we haven't been issuing uh, fines because I've said, uh, uh, Tom, to begin with, we've adopted a, uh, you know, a, a sort of in, in, encourage, encouraging approach to this rather than an enforcement approach, but it's beginning to, to change a little and go up a gear tomorrow, as I said. So people have been uh, asked to wear face coverings. It's been low level um, activity, but um, tomorrow is about stepping that uh, up and sending the message that we are stepping that up. Bob, do you want to say anything more about that? Yes, thanks, Andy. Um, no, there's definitely been no fines issued as yet. We started off, uh, the first approach was to educate and engage with as many passengers as possible. Uh, either through social media, face to face with staff uh, and through the various message boards we have. What we are doing is moving to a lower level of enforcement where we're able to direct people uh, to wear a face mask or ask them to leave the service or prevent them from getting onto the service. And if that's not sufficient in the future, then we'll go to the strongest form of enforcement. Thanks, Bob. Um, 
going to take a question from Eleanor Barlow at the Press Association, one for Andy and then Richard. Um, there have been reports about concerns that making postcode level data public could lead to certain communities being stigmatised. Do you think that is a concern? And has there been any update from the government on providing more detailed information to local authorities since your comments yesterday? I think we've um, kind of wrestled with this, uh, Eleanor, because in some ways, one of the challenges we've had is when the data is not complete, you know, what 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 do you do about that? You know, if you're putting out a partial picture of what's happening in communities, do, do you do that in terms of putting out what you've got, even if it's not telling the full story? So these are really difficult uh, considerations. And yeah, we, we, we know that it's obviously um, sometimes the poorest communities that have uh, suffered most from spread of the virus. You know, it's it's what's what's uh, kind of uh, done to those communities as a result. So there is a risk, isn't there? Um, and it, there is a uh, a need to to make sure that the data is both accurate and it's and it's used in the in the right way and not used uh, to divide people. But I've always been on the kind of the side of you know publish if we can as long as once we've got confidence in in the data and that's what you've seen in the last few weeks we have been publishing uh, as, as as much as we could uh, to to inform uh, people I, i'm not aware of any well as you know none of our councils have said don't don't publish data um, because obviously we have been publishing that data uh, in in recent weeks on a borough uh, borough level so um you know it was suggested at the weekend that councils had spoken out and stopped data being published I'm, I, we're not aware that any of our councils have, have said that. I think there is a worry about it being badged as a watch list and um, you know it kind of being portrayed in a very negative way and also this idea of these are the communities at risk of lockdown, very negative language as well. You know we think it should be more about um, communities that need support with health protection, framing it more positively. So there is a concern about language here definitely and then what that might do with regard to uh, the, the reputational damage in particular communities. It all needs to be handled uh, carefully, but um, certainly we're on the side of if we can publish good quality data, then we then we will. Uh, there hasn't been any uh, movement as far as I understand uh, on what I said yesterday. We, we've had more information from the government and we welcome that, but it's still not yet enough. And I think that position is not just a, a GM position, it's shared by uh, public health colleagues around the country. Thanks, Andy. I'll bring Richard in on that one. Uh, I, I don't think there is a risk of uh, stigmatisation. I, I don't think we've seen that with uh, uh, Leicester. What we've seen is that there is a problem. There is a problem that needs to be uh, dealt with. And particularly if we got into the position of having uh, particular community outbreaks anywhere in Greater Manchester, we can't manage that unless we tell people about that. Uh, it's an essential requirement that people are informed and informed so that they start to make the right decisions to protect their own health and the health of uh, others and although there are all sorts of flaws in the the data that is being uh, published and what it does do is to remind people on a regular pay, uh, basis that uh, continue to wash your hands often and for a longer period of time, continue to wear a mask, continue to socially distance. Um, it, we need to keep doing that until the virus is uh, completely beaten and we're a long way off from that. So uh, there, are, there are downsides to it, but I don't think communities uh, risk of being stigmatised, but it does help us to continue to deliver that message about uh, keep yourself safe, keep other people safe. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm going to take. Uh, I'm going to go back to Adam Clark's, but on this topic, I'm going to take Kevin Fitzpatrick's question for Radio Manchester. He asks, "How do you assess the prospect of places such as Rochdale and Oldham needing tighter restrictions, short of a new lockdown to deal with the outbreaks? Is any special effort being made with South Asian communities in cramped housing?" Uh, he cites Blackburn's public health director highlighting that as an issue there. So th thanks very much, Kevin. Um, to say again, it, it's my primary objective to avoid a local lockdown anywhere in Greater Manchester. I can't say whether we will be able to achieve that, but what I can say is we'll do everything we can within our power 
uh, to minimise the, the, the prospects of it. And you know, the figures that uh, Richard gave today show that you know we are in a, a reasonably uh, good position at this moment in time. And you know that that's not by chance. Greater Manchester has been working uh, in a very collaborative way all the way through this to su to support each other. Uh, and we've developed some really strong systems, um, testing, contact tracing, you know, all, all of this is helping us keep the figures moving uh, in the right direction. And we've now got higher levels of surveillance than we had before. So in terms of assessing the prospects of places like Rochdale and Oldham, well, you know, I I'm confident that we've got a, a level of support in place that's probably not matched anywhere else uh, in England. I think that's worth just uh, bearing, uh, bearing in mind. Um, we do all believe, uh, and this was very much the discussion I had with the leaders this morning, that there is a need for better messaging, more targeted messaging, uh, particularly in parts of GM where there might be a concern or, or an outbreak. Uh, the lessons from Leicester that we're beginning to, to, uh, to, to learn show that the targeted messaging in some communities really helped uh, to um, uh, to move things back in a positive direction. So you know, we're, we're learning all of those uh, things. We have more ability now to deploy uh, mobile uh, testing units and that has been used in, in Rochdale at a particular location. That too, I think, helps uh, and helps us um, uh, keep on, on top of things. So the answer is we're using all of these things. You know, we, we've got better data, though not everything. We've got more um, testing capacity. We're going to be using more targeted messaging. You know, all of these are tools um, that we have at our disposal now to avoid um, the, um, the, the the kind of the worst case scenario of a local local lockdown. It's got to be the last resort. I think in the case of Leicester, they didn't have all of the data and all of the tools to to prevent it, and it happened too quickly. Well, obviously, we want to 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 to, to keep ahead. Uh, ahead of all of that and that, that's our policy objective and we're working uh, flat out towards towards that um, that particular uh, particular goal. Thanks Andy, I'll bring Richard in. Uh, well a, a couple of things really. Uh, first of all on the data we've got is that Rochdale and Oldham are nowhere near needing tighter uh, restrictions and indeed their figures continue to move in the uh, right direction and uh, the comparison obviously will be made with uh, Leicester. Uh, there are absolutely nowhere near the sort of situation that Leicester was in uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think the second thing is, is that the question that clearly does relate directly to uh, some South Asian uh, communities. Um, we know again from uh, Leicester that in-family transmission has been an issue there, that that's something uh, I referred to uh, earlier. And we know from uh, Public Health England's data that uh, your ethnicity does make a difference on uh, your risk from COVID-19. So we, we can't avoid that evidence. What I, I know they've been doing very carefully in both Oldham and Rochdale is to work with communities on the basis of that uh, evidence to make sure that they do do everything possible to uh, protect using the sorts of uh, uh, things that Andy's just been talking about and we are learning from other places how to do it, uh, do it better. Uh, I think probably final thing I'll add from a, a Leicester point of view is that uh, the terminology of lockdown they found does not help. Uh, in fact it brings a certain amount of resistance from people to uh, participate in the measures to keep them uh, safe. So they started talking about uh, health protection areas. I, this is about uh, supporting people to look after themselves, not about uh, locking people uh, down. And I think that's perhaps something we ought to try and uh, push in Greater Manchester as well, that this is not about unnecessarily restricting people. It is about supporting people. It's about protecting them. So I think uh, that language is far more likely to get to people into a place where they want to uh, cooperate than using the lockdown language. Well, Ross, can I just say one more one more thing, to, uh, just, just an answer to, to Kevin's question. Kevin, just to reiterate uh, what I said yesterday, there is one tool we haven't yet got, which is that patient identifiable data. And just to stress again why this is important and would be important in Oldham and, and, and Rochdale, it helps you get immediately to the source of the outbreak if you know the name of the person who has tested 
uh, positive and then you can immediately do that detective work with um, family friends of that of that person and or you can find out if it's the workplace was where that person picked that up and then work there so you know that level of intelligence is is in our view critical uh, to to giving old and Rochelle the best prospects of avoiding a local lockdown uh, and it's why we continue to make the case to the government you know there are clear procedures for uh, handling notifiable diseases of which COVID-19 is one and we'll be in a, a position to uh, hopefully do everything possible once we've got that level of, of data at our fingertips and uh, we're still making the argument for that at the moment. Uh, on the topic of patient identifiable uh, data, Jen Williams at the MEN uh, asks that Matt Hancock said in the comments yesterday that patient identifiable data is available to local authorities when they sign a data protection agreement um, where COVID testing is concerned. Is this correct from your perspective? Uh, no, uh, it's not, uh, Jen. So again, I've uh, checked this with um, the lead director of public health um, who has said to me that even if uh, local authorities are signing uh, the um, the data uh, protection agreement they're still not provided uh, with um, the patient identifiable data that I've just been mentioning in response to uh, to Kevin's question and I think there's a confusion here uh, that the Secretary of State has repeated and officials in his department have, have, have repeated there's a confusion between patient identifiable data, i.e. name, date of birth, NHS number, and individual pseudonymized data, to use that, that phrase, uh, where you can't immediately find out who that, who that, uh, that test uh, relates to. And that's, there's a, they, they talk of individual level data. It's not the same as patient identifiable data. And what I just finally say on this is, is if the, um, Health Secretary is having trouble uh, understanding uh, the data and the difference between the two things that I've just mentioned, then I'm happy to say today I can make my experts available to him uh, to take him through the data to help him understand. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, I'll bring in Sir Richard on that one. Uh, well, I, I think every district in Greater Manchester and has now uh, got a data protection agreement in place none of them have got patient identifiable uh, uh, data. I think that's it. Simple as that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Richard. Um, final question from Adam Clark at Roch Valley Radio. Uh, Matt Hancock, uh, another Matt Hancock question. He said on uh, Media Round this morning that people in offices won't be required to wear face coverings like they are in shops and public transport. So Richard, we'll take, go to you first on this one. Is this something you agree with? And if you've got any final comments as well. Uh, I, I think there have been lots and lots of arguments about uh, uh, face masks, whether they make a difference, whether they don't make a, a, a difference. Uh, I think if there is a chance of them making a difference, then it's worth wearing. It's not that much of an imposition, and I guess uh, we are all s slowly getting used to it. Uh, we know that there is a bigger risk in uh, confined spaces indoors than uh, outdoors. Uh, that would seem to suggest that in an office environment, where you've got indoors in a relatively confined space, that wearing masks is a better idea than not wearing uh, masks. So whether you make it compulsory or not, I think that'll be quite difficult in what's effectively private uh, uh, premises. But I think we ought to be positively encouraging uh, the wearing of masks in anything where people in a working situation come into close proximity with other people. Thanks, Richard. I'll bring in Andy on this one and for any final comments. Thanks, uh, thanks Ross. So Adam, on your question, um, I, well, I agree with Richard, you know, uh, we shouldn't be as specific as saying, oh yes, in this setting or not in another, because that in itself builds a bit of confusion, you know, and the pattern has been throughout this, originally the government saying they wouldn't be needed on transport, then they were, they wouldn't be needed in shops, then they were, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we got this statement from the sec health secretary saying they won't be needed in offices and then later on the line people say, oh, maybe they are. I think it's just better to get more consistent, clear messaging saying that masks can only help you. They can only help you. They can only help the people around you. Uh, this is a culture change that we all need to um, embrace and um, government ministers need to, to show it uh, themselves in their own uh, actions. 
Um, and, you know, we've seen some of them out and about still not wearing masks. They need to, to lead from the front and they need to, uh, uh, to, to show that this is a culture change that we all need to adopt. And, and actually in any enclosed space, there's going to be a good reason for, for wearing one. Um, if you can do what you're doing without it disrupting your actions, then, then probably you should wear one. So um, I, I just think we're, we're at that point uh, now and we shouldn't completely say that they won't be needed at all in offices. I don't think that that is uh, the right um, the right message. Um, of course, people won't want to wear them all the time as if they're in an isolated situation. But when in and around other people, when, as Sir Richard said, then it's it's probably a respectful and a good, good idea. Um, just then finally, I think, you know, this is a problem generally as to where we are at the moment. There's just too much confusion has crept in, I think. Andy, in sorry, before you sum up, yeah. can I just come back very briefly? Do, yeah. yeah. I, I just uh, had a horrible feeling for anybody looking at this picture, they will see I'm actually in my office, which I'm not normally. It's uh, I've had come in today to get my bike repaired and I'm not wearing a mask and I don't want to be accused of uh, hypocrisy around this. So I have to say that within the town hall extension at the moment, the nearest person to me is about three rooms away and about 50 metres away. And if I do come into close proximity, I do have my mask <laughs> in my pocket ready to put on. That's, I thought I'd just bet me that clear, Andy. But, no, very helpful, perfectly illustrating my, my last point, I think, there, there, Richard. And you do look in glorious uh, isolation uh, there at the moment. But um, I think it's, it's just important to not be hard and fast about these things, you know, wear one if you can and if it's appropriate and if you're around other people might be a, a better way of approaching it. Um, but just I was just saying, you know, just the confusion that's kind of crept in in recent times about this issue, but also the data. I, I don't think any of us want to be in a prolonged argument with the government about data. Let's just resolve this uh, and give everybody at the front line of this as many tools as they need to chase this virus down. That's all we're asking for. We're just asking for the tools to do the job and, and actually help the government do the job of fighting this virus uh, nationally. So I, I just want us to get beyond this and get to a position where we're a kind of working in partnership, national, local, and um, we've got our eye on the ball, which is a virus that's still amongst us, but also uh, and a, a winter that's approaching without the, the safety net of a vaccine. You know, that that's the issue we've all got to get our, our focus on. Uh, and, you know, let's clear up some of this confusion that in some ways has distracted us uh, in recent in recent times. So uh, I uh, hope the government hear that in the way I intend it. Uh, I'm uh, really uh, grateful to you all again for attending this and to Sir Richard for uh, uh, for giving his his update as well. Um, and if you could publicise the um, uh, the service of remembrance for us, we would be be really, really grateful because, you know, there are people out there who've had COVID and are still suffering with the after effects of COVID. And I think some of those people find the kind of idea that the world's returning to normal and isn't noticing what it's like to be them is is is, is difficult. But I think it's also the case with bereaved families. You know, it's been a really terrible time for them. They've still not been able to grieve properly. Just taking a moment tomorrow to, to, to recognise this and to focus on those people, to focus on those families is a really important thing to do. And we'd be so grateful for your uh, cooperation in that. So with that, Ross, that's enough from me. Uh, thank you to you all for, for, uh, for, for attending as normal. And we will 